to support excellence in teaching. This is our speaker series. It's called Pondering Excellence in Teaching. Uh, my name is Javier Hines. I'm the executive administrator of the center. I help put on these talks, and I'm happily introducing Laura Wentworth today on behalf of our director, Janet Carlson. Um, as many of you may have noted, this talk was rescheduled from earlier in the month, so Janet couldn't be here today. She had some travel, unfortunately, and could not attend. Uh, so these talks, Pondering Excellence in Teaching, are something that we started about three years ago. And the idea is to really hone in on what that word excellence means in the teaching profession. It's something that gets used a lot in a lot of different ways. And uh, we wanted to have an opportunity late in the afternoon so that community members outside of Stanford, teachers and administrators could have an opportunity to, to join in that discussion. And um, so that's what we're here to do today. That's what we're all about. And because Janet thought that I might just sort of ramble on here and hijack the evening, uh, she gave me some words to say about Laura and her talk in particular. So to prove I can read in public, here we go. <laughs> Welcome to CSET. I'm very sorry to be missing this talk because partnerships with schools are essential to the work that CSET is trying to do to improve instruction, develop leading teachers, and promote the equitable learning of all students. One of the reasons CSET has been able to develop meaningful partnerships, particularly with the San Francisco Unified School District, is because of Laura Wentworth. Laura is absolutely gifted, is absolutely gifted at understanding what all the members of a budding partnership can gain from working together. She is masterful at bringing together the right people to both initiate new work and keep work moving forward. When I think about people who are capable of pondering excellence in teaching, and using that pondering for gener generating actual work that matters, Laura is at the top of that list. Please welcome Laura Wentworth and enjoy the time to ponder what it means to create and foster meaningful research practice partnerships. So without further ado, Laura. Thank you. I am reminded, and I knew I was going to forget, Jen over here is going to be taking some pictures during our evening. And if anyone does not want their picture taken or posted for any reason, please speak with her and let her know. <laughs> Me, I don't want my picture taken. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Javier, so much. And thank you for CSET for hosting this talk. Um, I just want to take a minute to introduce myself. I'm Laura Wentworth. For those of you who don't know, I work for an organization called California Education Partners, which supports collaboration in the education sector. Most of you people on campus know me as being the director of the partnership between Stanford Graduate School of Education and San Francisco Unified School District. Um, I also am supporting uh, an evolving partnership with some local school districts in the GSC here too. I'm also an alumni, graduated in 2010, um, and I'm here to talk about this intersection between research and practice, um, and specifically what are, specifically reminding everyone to turn off their cell phones, right? Um, but specifically, I want to talk about what are the skills that we need to support or to embody in order to actually make those partnerships successful. Um, so actually, I just want to back up for a second. When I, when I, was, uh, when I was asked to give this talk, um, I actually had a half-written paper um, about this topic that I was working on, not on my own. Um, it was I was working on it with uh, my colleague here, Nora Ming, from San Francisco Unified School District. Another colleague, Ritu Khanna, Deborah Steifek, who you all know, and Michelle Renisher in SIPA. And how that paper got started was um, I was really talking about this idea that we needed a, a, new, a new academic, a new version of how we build and support the skills and knowledge that doctoral students need um, to actually work in the field today and produce the knowledge that's going to push our theory and push our policy and push our practice. Um, as I was having those conversations, conversations, it was actually Michelle who said, Laura, you also need to think about the administrative skills, right, to participate in this partnering work. Um, and uh, in that conversation, there was a lot of talk about the skills were implied and that they were implicit skills, that we, the way we're designed right now, things 
uh, you might learn by watching your uh, advisor do something, or you might learn by watching your superintendent do something. But in your training, you don't necessarily get the skills to do the partnering work. Um, and so that's how this idea got started. So I'm hoping in this agenda, we have enough time for you to ask questions and also kind of test these theories and these ideas and these concepts because they're somewhat half-baked. Um, so I will explore why, why these partnering skills matter, uh, uh, what does the literature imply are the skills needed for partnering, and then also from the experience that I've had, how does um, my experiences relate to what the literature is saying. And then I'll talk about implications at the end and things that we could do to actually support building these skills. So why do these skills matter? So there is plenty of research out there that um, says that research is not necessarily automatically useful evidence to inform policy and practice decisions. I cite two uh, books here, who, which I think are worth a read if you want to explore this topic. But they, they have multiple chapters and there's multiple journal articles on this divide between research and practice. Um, and there's been some attempts to try to close that divide, right? And, and sometimes people are trying to close that divide by thinking about, well, we need to have a different approach to our different approach to doing research. Um, there's uh, design-based implementation research. There's in improvement science. Um, there's others that argue that we just need uh, different processes for working together. So you'll hear people talk about research practice partnerships. You'll hear people talk about network improvement communities and this concept of collective impact. I'm not going to go into those today, but the idea is that these there are solutions being talked about to this divide. And I think one thing um, uh, I'm going to advocate for today is that uh, these, the, across these solutions, they imply that um, and a, a, that that the people that are involved need a certain set of essential skills in order to participate in these solutions. Um, so let's start by thinking about what exactly do we mean? What, what exactly do I mean by partnering? And in this instance, um, it's really where two or more people, can't just be one person, can't partner by yourself. It's two or more people coming together who shared an activity or relationship. Usually in the, the cases across here, um, you'll see, see people coming together from different organizations, right? It could be, for example, in the work I work in, it's a school district and a large university, but it could also be a community-based organization and um, you know, uh, about a, a group that does about research evaluation. Um, there are lots of different forms of this, but really it's, it's the, I want to call out the definition of two or more people. Okay. Yes, it might be these organizations coming together, but the people, as you'll see as we explore the literature and the, my experience, is the people really matter. And then this one concept that in partnering, it's not only, it does not only involve translational work, but that it involves, um, and, and why would translational work just to define that, because that, that, that term gets thrown out a lot, right? So you hear, um, we need to translate research into practice. Oh, I, I finished, I have these research findings. I, I'm not quite sure how to translate them in for the practitioners, um, which involves that there's this space, right, between research and practice that needs to be, um, that needs to be, uh, 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 that needs to be, um, condensed and shortened and, and that the research when it's produced isn't actually designed to be delivered directly to the practitioners. Um, and then also to uh, partnering involves joint work. So it's a collaborative effort where both researchers and practitioners are achieving their goals through a jointly designed project. So you can see the difference here between the translational work where there's this space between research and practice practice. And then in joint work, it's where they're working side by side together from the very beginning. Um, I think that's the key 
uh, piece here in how we define partnering. It needs to start from the beginning. Okay, so now here's kind of my call to action for why I think, again, uh, these skills are important. So if we don't define these skills, it will be tra challenging to train future academics to participate in this work. Now, a lot of you in this room, um, and I should say also train administrators in this work. Now, a lot of you have been in research for a long time. Some of you may be from the world of practice, and you said, well, I learned these skills on the job. Why can't everyone learn these skills on the job? But if this is a new way of working, that we think is really important and to elevate the status of that work, we will need to name these skills and we will need to think about what is the training that will help um, doctoral students and future administrators actually um, have these skills to execute from day one in their job. So now we'll talk about the literature. Um, the review I did, I looked at the more current literature on um, answering this question of what does the literature imply or the skills needed for partnering. Um, and I did that because there is actually a pretty deep base of literature on partnership if you start to look. Um, and I wanted to limit and define it for what are, what are we seeing is most recently said about partnering in general and these skills. And then what I do is I, uh, once I, I'll explain to you the list of skills that showed up in that review, um, I'm going to dive deeply into a set of them and think about uh, how were they defined and then what do these look like in practice. Okay, so this was the list that uh, was generated of the different types of skills I saw when I looked across this set of literature. Um, again, I'll go into what the literature was later in this talk, but I just wanted to point these out from the very beginning because I'm not going to be talking about all of them. Again, what do you see? It's a diverse set of skills. Um, it uh, are things that might not be easy, easy to teach. Uh, we might be really good in graduate schools of education at teaching research methods, but do we do well in teaching how to communicate our findings to multiple audiences. How do you teach interpersonal skills? You know, oftentimes in teacher training you hear, oh, where do teachers te uh, learn behavior management? Oh, they learn it during their student teaching. Um, they, you don't learn it in the classroom, right? Um, could this be also true for these interpersonal skills as it is today? Negotiation skills. I often hear um, the, in the negotiation between a researcher and practitioner of a joint project, they are trying to come up with some joint work together and they're negotiating um, the project so that it um, is mutually beneficial to both of them. And in this negotiation, sometimes it kind of sounds like a sales pitch, right? From, maybe from the researcher, maybe from the administrator, depending on what the project is. But the negotiation skills um, wind up being really important, especially at the beginning of the project, to set the project on a certain um, trajectory. Implementation skills, too. Uh, you know, this could be seen as operations in general. So, okay, I have these research findings, and we've designed this intervention, and we need, we need to set out and go um, actually execute this program or policy or intervention or whatever it is. Um, and at the same time, we're going to operationalize the research side by side with that. Um, that has a lot to do with uh, implementation and, and all the workings of um, how to make those uh, execute all the different uh, uh, checklists of things that you need to do when you're working um, on a, a research project that's based in practice. I'd say to the, the strategizing skills and the coaching skills, these are the skills that came up least frequency, fr frequently, but I'd say they um, are some things that maybe projects or people that have been working in the partnership sphere uh, wind up showing a little more often. Um, 
it's hard to, uh, when you're an administrator and you're used to working in isolation on your strategy or strategizing, knowing when to bring a researcher in as a thought partner at a given time, at the right moment. Um, but that's a, if, if you have that skill, you're quite advanced at partnering. If uh, coaching skills, so if you're a researcher and you want to work with uh, a practitioner um, and you want to uh, potentially work on a project with them, um, yet you want to start developing a relationship with, with them, share your know-how, come to one of a thought partner, um, you have to know how to share that information in a way that's supportive, that's not seen as judgmental. So the idea that you'd be coaching this administrator or the administrator might be coaching the researcher um, is a skill that comes into play. So I'm going to dive in deeply to the top three, which the research skills, the communication skills, and the interpersonal skills. And just to clarify, these skills are for both researchers and practitioners. Okay, So when I'm talking about them, um, I would expect to see these types of skills. They might look a little different uh, for researchers um, or practitioners, but I would expect <coughs> to see them in both communities. Um, okay. So let's talk about research skills. Now, asking a researchable question is something that all, I mean, that's kind of a standard for academics, right? Um, but it's not necessarily a standard for academics when you are, um, sorry, it's not necessarily a standard for administrators. Uh, you, they might be able to ask questions that support continuous improvement or ask questions related to an inquiry of a policy analysis. But to ask a researchable question, it does take a little skill and know-how. Um, you'll see here the list of um, uh, literature that I reviewed, uh, uh, most of which come from um, like the, the Roderick, uh, Easton, and Sebring article, the Lopez, Turley, and Stevens, the De Simone, Wolford, and Hill, um, and the Heinrich, Cobb, Pemwell, and Clark. Oh, sorry, not that one. Uh, the other three I mentioned, they are all actually pieces that were written about a collaboration specifically and what they've learned from that. The coburn penwell Giel piece is, is a piece that's specifically about research practice partnerships, as is the Heinrich, Cobb, Penwell, and Clark piece. Um, and then the last piece, sorry, I should also call out, is a piece I wrote with Deborah Steinbeck and Richard Krenza on the Stanford SFUSD partnership, um, so it's very context specific. But you'll see three of the um, six uh, pieces I reviewed here really uh, focus in on these, uh, the research skill of asking a researchable question. Um, and so then I asked myself, well, so where have I seen this in practice? And what's an example of this? Um, <laughs> In this instance, uh, this you probably recognize one of these people. This is Professor Tom D, and this is a, um, Assistant Superintendent Bill Sanderson, which actually the quote should be flipped. Um, so sorry, this, that um, photo has a bit of a um, typo in it. Um, you're welcome to read the quotes, but the point of the photo was to share a story with you. Um, so here, uh, Tom D. was very interested in working on research in SFUSD. Um, I paired him together with Bill Sander Sanderson, and in their first meeting, Bill could rattle off five very researchable questions. Now, why can Bill do this? He's been a longtime administrator, and he's worked with a lot of different researchers, and he somewhat has a notion and an understanding of what would be a question that you might work on for evaluation, might, what might be a question that he would explore an inquiry on his own, and what would be a good question to answer with a research partner. Um, Tom gave some good criteria of um, what could be a study he'd be interested in working on. Yes, he's an economist, and he was interested in anything, any question that you might be able to answer using a threshold, right? So he wanted to get to a quasi-experimental design. He was interested in things that had clear cutoffs in terms of, hey, did you implement with this indicator or that indicator? Um, they wound up uh, narrowing in after having a couple discussions on a research question looking at 
um, uh, curriculum that the district had implemented uh, focused on ethnic studies. And Bill actually said to Tom, um, uh, no, first, sorry, first Tom said to Bill, um, name me something with a criteria, right? And uh, Bill started talking through the studies, and when we landed on the ethnic studies curriculum, it turned out that the district had implemented that curriculum in a certain set of schools using an, in, an early warning indicator that was actually developed in partnership with the John Gardner Center. Um, and because of that, uh, Tom D. could pull off his study, his quasi-experimental study design, um, and actually produce just-in-time research for a board decision related to that ethnic studies curriculum. They were trying to decide should they spread that course um, to every high school based on this pilot and the findings if you haven't heard yet were very positive about the initial pilot course um, so back to the point of asking researchable questions it takes a certain know-how on bill sanderson's part or an administrator's part to ask a question that is going to be researchable and of interest to a researcher and will also produce information that will be useful for the administrator in the end. Okay, so I'm gonna use a term here that you see a lot in research, triangulating evidence. You also, in, in research we think about it as the use of multiple methods to study one research question, but it's also used to mean the use of two or more different measures uh, of the same variable. And here I'm using it as a, a skill to take multiple forms of evidence about a decision that's going to be made um, in, in the administrative setting <coughs> and to factor that evidence into that decision. Um, I also will use it in another instance here from the research side in terms of if you're a researcher and you're working in partnership, you will start uh, and you have these, and, and in partnership you potentially could have a long-term relationship with the practitioner you're working with, you're going to have a number of studies, right? And your research is, um, you'd start building a body of research. And what happens is you start holding a body of evidence that the administrator may refer to. And so the researcher needs to be able to, in the discussions and the thought partnership with the practitioner, call on that body of evidence and multiple points of evidence from the body of research. And so um, you'll see this was called out in three of the six um, research I reviewed. And I want to talk about uh, one, an example from practice. So this is uh, Susanna Loeb, um, who all of you know, a professor here, and um, this is uh, Carla Bryant, who was the former chief of early education in San Francisco Unified. Um, and Carla and Susanna had a long, a long relationship where they produced lots of research, but the reason why they exemplify this idea of triangulating evidence is because they started with one small study. Um, that evolved from some uh, Carla doing an analysis herself and of the district. She looked at the budget. She looked at the um, at the what the teachers were doing. Uh, she looked at the current research, and she was trying to co find come up with a cost-effective um, li early literacy assessment that could span pre-K three, um, but that could also had you know, promising research and findings behind it. She looked to, um, actually at the time, it was the deputy superintendent who asked uh, Suzanne Lowe if she was interested in working on this. They said yes. Um, but the idea that Carla could look across the, the, those evidence in her own inquiry uh, was her, um, sorry, here, it was her effort at triangulating that information. Um, to then make the decision to even enter in to a research study um, with Susanna, where they did initially their first study together was to select and test across uh, a set of elementary schools and early literacy assessment. So they did that. They actually didn't get great findings from that study. They only continued to use, because of those findings, they only continued to use that assessment at the preschool level. 
but then they had this body of knowledge that they kind of worked on together. Um, and so they then uh, turned to developing, um, you know, Carla was also going, uh, looking at the findings from the research, thinking about um, some other assessments that were being done across the district, and then also thinking about um, how she could work with all the head starts that were um, in San Francisco. And what she really wanted to do was develop a common measure of kindergarten readiness. So she turned to Susanna and said, hey, can you help me do this? And Susanna said, sure, let's do it. Um, is there anything else you're interested in? Oh, Carla said, well, we've been looking at some information related to parent engagement, and we really think that that's another area that we're... See how Carla's starting to call up multiple forms of evidence. She's taking these multiple forms of evidence and she's using that as rationale for either for starting research or for making a decision. Um, Susanna at the same time now here is, um, they go on to develop a kindergarten readiness measure and also go on to test a parent engagement strategy using texting, which winds up having very successful findings. And now Susanna has become this longtime partner with Carla and actually holds a lot of the knowledge about the research findings related back to Carla's work. And so in their subsequent meetings, it's not just Carla who's bringing evidence from the field and other research and reports and, and thinking about those at the problem at hand, it's Susanna who starts to do that too. Um, okay, so communication skills. Speaking and writing about findings. This is actually something academics get some training in, right? When you come here, you learn how to write an academic paper. Um, you don't, unless you take maybe Sam Weinberg's class, or there's a few other classes where you learn how to write for other audiences. Um, as academics, we don't get a lot of training on what are the different types of ways we need to both write and speak to different types of audiences. Um, this actually, again, you'll see the frequency was much higher here, communication across um, these uh, uh, different um, research studies. Um, I, I thought what was most interesting up here, um, the Roderick Easton and Sebring study, which is a, st uh, a paper out of the University of Consortium, um, at the University of Chicago, uh, describing the consortium on Chicago School Research, a longtime center at the University of Chicago, who um, it's a partnership between the University of Chicago and Chicago Public Schools. Um, they're kind of the granddaddy of uh, research practice partnerships. And they made a big point around engagement and communication of findings and making findings accessible in their paper. Um, yes, while I was mentioned in these other things, I thought it was really interesting that one of the longest standing partnerships did that. Um, and so just to talk about, uh, not to embarrass him because he's here, but to talk about a partnership with Claude Goldenberg and Christina Wong. Um, this is a, a project that uh, Susanna, I know Susanna, sorry, Christina and Claude were working on a project to address a problem in the district. The district has is under a consent decree related to instructing its English learners. And Christina had a tool that they developed um, for helping to understand whether they were meeting certain levels of compliance around instruction. And as their, uh, uh, but yet uh, Christina knew this wasn't a perfect tool. Um, she also knew it wasn't that producing helpful information, not just for compliance, but for the schools themselves that they were examining. Um, she had also been involved in a study with Sean Reardon, looking across their different um, programs serving English learners, and had some findings about that, but still asked the question, how do we know what's actually going on inside these different programs um, instructionally? And so she wanted to work on this tool that they had for compliance and improve it. And so um, along came Claude Goldberg, who uh, had a lot of skill in this area, had just been working on building an observation protocol. Um, but what I found most interesting, and in why this relates back to the communication skill, is so when Claude and Christina would get in the room and to work on this, 
uh, project, Claude was really adept at taking from his uh, world of research all the research and, and explaining it to the administrators around the table um, as it relates to their context. Because if you know anything about San Francisco administrators, they're a little bit stubborn. They uh, have their experience and they want to hold on to it. And, and, and they would laugh if I were, if they were sitting up in the front they would laugh. Enormous laughing, see, she knows. So they learn things in the field and they're like, well, we do this this way. And Claude would be like, well, that's not what the research says. But he didn't say it like that. <laughs> say it much more politely. And that's actually a skill. Okay, because I have seen uh, researchers in different settings uh, deliver things in a way that seemed almost offensive, right, to the uh, practitioners. And so knowing that nuance, and then also writing, writing is key. So you sit and write technical things all the time as researchers, but then when you need to go write a brief that could potentially be consumed by a practitioner, um, it can be really hard to live within those two writing worlds. And so how do you develop those skills as well? Okay, so the last one. I just called this out because you can see this is across every single one of these studies. And if I had done the meta-analysis on every other study on partnering, I think you would probably see this stand out. So this idea of interpersonal skills, a lot of people call this relationships. But I think interpersonal skills are a better way to talk about it. Because there's intrapersonal, right? What's kind of going on inside of your head, your own personal thinking that you're not sharing. But the interaction, the interpersonal skills that you're having with people. And I'm going to call out consistent, I could call it a lot of different skills under this category. But I'm going to call out consistently attending meetings. Sounds simple, right? Not so simple. Also, having consistent meetings. So I'm going to tell a story about, um, a project that the Associate Director of Scope, Ann Jaguit, has worked on with this large, notice all the administrators she's working with? This is, this is Ann, this is Adit, you guys recognize, and Liam. Those are the doctoral students, but all the other administrators that she's working on. To coordinate the, this group, uh, this is, these are the special assistant, uh, the assistant, sorry, this is the lead, what's considered the lead team. Most of these are directors or assistant superintendents. Uh, supervising the principals in the elementary schools. And they were working with Anne on um, helping them do a better job of providing learning experiences for the principals, and then also being a group doing their own continuous improvement on their work together. Uh, but I want to tell a little story about Anne and Eve here. This is the key um, administrator working here. They met every week for a year. Every week, and I, I would talk to both of them, they would have quite arduous conversations, um, detailed, you know, and getting into the facts. But the consistency of the meeting, by the end of the project, the trust and the relationships. Now, do all these people have perfect interpersonal skills? No. But the, the, the behavior of showing up was a, what is a skill that you have to know is valued and important. Uh, uh, you know, I think it was my father that said, you know, half of life is showing up, just be there. But I think, um, I actually think it's in these partnerships, I have seen it make or break the partnerships. Um, I've seen a lot of canceled meetings, I'm sorry I'm late, I missed a phone call, I delivered a message by email or not by telephone. All those things matter. Um, and those really are interpersonal skills. How do you teach those? Let's talk about that. So, what are the research and pol uh, what what research and policies of, uh, does the field need to explore and support these skills? Um, I'm hoping to talk about this section, and then I'm really hoping you guys are sitting here, going to ask questions and push my thinking. I know Rachel Lotan is for sure, um, but I, I really hope we can have a conversation on dialogue after this. Okay, so. We really need further research um, to articulate the skills and understand their impact. Everything I shared today is really hypothetical. And even the papers that are out there, um, there are a couple centers right now 
funded by IAS that are studying the use of research by administrators in the education sector. They have some findings that say things like, um, how do the administrators get their research? Um, they get it by reading books or talking to their colleagues. Um, ha they they other also have findings talking about the different types of use and that we, they think that uh, the conceptual use or the influence of the research over the um, administrator's thinking is just as powerful as instrumental use, actually deliberately using research in a um, decision. But here, I, I feel like there's been a call to action around um, re more research on these skills. And here, I just want to read a quote from Cynthia Coburn and Bill Pemwell's uh, piece that reiterates this. This research is necessary to assess the impact of not only funders' investments, but also the time that researchers and practitioners are investing in this work. I mean, we've all done research and then partnership <coughs> research. It takes time. Should we be doing this? Do we think it matters? Um, it is also necessary to inform the growing number of researchers and practitioners who are involved in these partnerships, providing information about when and under what conditions different partnership strategies bear food. Furthermore, research in this realm could help researchers and practitioners new to this work learn the skills, strategy, and roles and identities that may be necessary to do it well. I feel like that last line really hits it home in terms of, for me, in terms of uh, if we expect uh, the next generation of <coughs> academics and administrators to actually be doing this type of work, we really need to be teaching them these skills and strategies up front. Um, or else, our, how can we expect them to do it? So, um, also just this concept of needing new policies to support the, the development of these skills. Um, so, if the field wants to support research done in partnership, there's some signs of that, right? We see different, you know, improvement science or DVIR. Um, even the learning sciences has been around for a while, has some elements of partnering skills involved. If the research suggests these partnering skills are important, um, important these part these partnership with to these researchers and practitioners, then potentially schools of education. Other organizations, I'm not quite sure yet, you can kind of see me chewing on this here, will need policies and practices to develop the partnering skills of future academics and, and administrators. This is the part, where does this sit? I've, heard, I've been in a number of conversations right now. Who's going to hold this work? Who, whose responsibility is this? If we say we're going to be doing this, are we just going to learn these skills by osmosis? Um, what, what is going to be our method for learning these skills if we're, if we're going to be doing the partnership work? So I will leave you with that question, and I, I look forward to Q&A right now. I just want to thank again CSET and California Education Partners, my employer, and also this, you can tell this uh, work would not be as rich without uh, the partnership between San Francisco Unified School District, so thank you, Norma. And my colleagues at Stanford School of Ed, thank you, Michelle, thank you, Deborah. Um, and I'm ready for questions, comments. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, so some of the skills you mentioned, I'm thinking interpersonal skills in particular, are really hard to teach and cultivate. Yeah. Um, some people are just better at speaking, better with people, right. and I don't know Chris what you or whatever. I, I wonder if then maybe the, the better strategy going forward isn't so much to cultivate these skills in people as it is to maybe match people with the skills to the task of creating partnerships. Do you think there's anything to that? Um, so do you mean people that work at the intersection between research and practice and, and put people that are good at these skills in those roles. Correct. So I think I went back up a little bit and say, um, if the field at large, okay, so generally we have the modus operandi of the field um, could be seen as basic research, right? Which doesn't involve partnering. And, and if that's the case, um, then maybe our institutions don't need to think about wide scale training. They might need to be training a subset, like you're saying, of people that are specializing in this work. That 
that's kind of a question mark in my head. So if people are really um, thinking about doing this at a large scale, we have a you have a dean of the Graduate School of Education right now that thinks, and you've had another one before that, and another one before that that thinks that partnerships are important and it's going to help make our research relevant. Well, if that is the that is the case, then I think as a school or an organization, we might want to take a stand about everyone that's involved here having a certain minimum level of skill around that and practicing that. I would agree with you. I think that is the black box. I mean, that's why you see it come up um, as across all the literature. Um, but thank you for your comment. Great question. Yes. So I, I'm used to having a lot of conversations about this kind of stuff, particularly what can the universities be doing around researchers? Sure, can you speak a little louder, please? Yeah, so I was just saying I'm used to kind of having these conversations where we're thinking about what is it that the researchers can do? How can we improve our skills? I'm just curious what's happening at the district level. Mm -hmm. I mean, are there similar conversations and professional development that are going on there? Is the superintendent thinking of anything? So yes, that's somewhat Norma's job in the research department. So I, I will let her also answer that question. Um, and we've had that question from day one so when we established the Stanford SFUSD partnership. Because there is something about administrators in San Francisco that are either all but dissertation or have their doctorate. They are a little bit better. They come in with skills, right? And so then what is the responsibility of the district for, for administrators that don't come in with those skills? Um, and, and, and I think the research department has done some work in that. Um, but there, and, and we've toyed with the idea of a course. Uh, but we're not, we're not there yet. Actually, we've looked at, um, Harvard had a course, but it was more focused on um, the work of researchers working at schools. And we were, we've been looking at their syllabus for a long time, thinking how could we um, translate that into district administrators. But Norma, you want to answer that question? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say that what we do in the research department in SFUSD is think very deliberately about what we can do to promote the effective use of research evidence. That is a major goal that we have. So with some people, we do that deliberately in terms of how we promote the partnership with external partners because you're working with actual researchers who can help model that and help you co-develop some of the research questions. But there are also a lot of other opportunities that happen internally within the district where the goals are more closely aligned with the work that people are already having to do. We find that that is an opportunity where there is greater leverage because it's work people have to do anyway. What can we do to build in evidence as part of the decision making that they have to do? What can we do to incorporate more rigor? What can we do to help people think a little bit more concretely about the reasons that they're giving? What is the theory that drives it? As opposed to the intuitive theories that might be going around, what can we do to pin that down and then ask people, how would you test these? It's something that we're trying to do on an ongoing basis. It's why this year in particular, we've been looking at the district's approach to continuous improvement and trying to formalize that through specific practices of improvement science and trying to spread that across different areas of leadership to help people think in a more effective way, a more rigorous use of theory and evidence toward actual decision making where they have to be doing it. I will say just as evidence for what Norma's saying, so the district, when I first arrived, only had a supervisor of evaluation. They didn't even, and they had a research department, but they, did, they had their person who was managing all their evaluation also manage their research. And now Norma's position, position as a supervisor of research really gives them a person to actually hold that um, developing the skills that will help them work with researchers, and not just the Stanford partnership either. I was going to say, yeah, I think my question might might have even been a little broader because I feel like there's been this call to action from the university where we should right. be training our doctoral students right. across the board, all mm -hmm. schools should be doing this. And I know we have this amazing relationship with San Francisco and you yeah. guys are unique in so many ways. So I'm say you want broader. Well, I'm just wondering who is the, who is the audience that mm -hmm. one would talk to about this? Like, mm -hmm. are you thinking, you know... So I've heard, com I've been in conversations where states are involved and like, what do we need um, in terms of a, uh, in the credential for the administrator? What types of courses do you need to take? That's partly why at the end here it says, uh, sorry, it's not going back, but in the end it says institutes or uh, schools of education. Schools of education are also where oftentimes the administrators get their credential. 
So it could be that they're just taking more courses to meet that credential. But that is the pre-service, right? I think I, the reason why I interpreted your question as, and I automatically thought of it as, what do we, what are we doing in service for these principal, uh, for these administrators? And to me, you're going to need both. Um, but it really, the most of it, I've heard it from states <coughs> and their responsibility to change requirements for certifications, <coughs> which I think will have implications for schools of education. Rachel, and then Billy. Ah, Rachel. So you asked um, a very complex question, Laura, and um, I don't want to sound facetious when I give a simple answer. <laughs> Uh, for me, the, the key words uh, that you also put up there, which are my two favorite words, uh, mm -hmm. are joint work. Mm -hmm. And you actually learn, both, both partners, I think, learn by doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so engaging in this work, um, I think, will get you more mileage than theoretical courses at the university. Can I push you on that though a little bit? Because yes. so partly partly I am in the business of making a lot of matches between researchers and practitioners. And I often I often see them not work when um, when one side, I won't say which researcher or practitioner, just doesn't know how to engage. Right? And so the learning by doing there has to be a context that, oh, this is a time for learning, or this is an experimental time. Because oftentimes it's such high stakes that, like, especially if I'm pairing an assistant professor who's got to get tenure, and they, and they you know, as a, and even a, a professor generally that this, like, funding could be <coughs> relying on this. Um, or with the administrator only has so much time, and, and they can expend it this way or that way, and this needs to be... It, it, there's a lot of pressure when it comes to this. So I'm just wanting to ask you a question back. If it, it, you know, how then do we put it in the context of that kind of pressure-filled, sometimes high-stakes situation when you're partnering? Um, no, just, uh, speaking from my many experience yes. in, in these kinds of partnerships, it is something that both sides really want and are interested in because they do have a common goal uh, and a common vision of what it is that they want to get to. And um, like any partnership that requires you know, developing trust, uh, it requires sometimes mediation, which you do so well, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and um, really having the patience to stick it out. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that sometimes it's an issue of um, perceived legitimacy. Mm -hmm. um, and <coughs> that, of course, has to do with, um, I think it's more than interpersonal relationships. Mm. Uh, I Status? Think no, I think legitimacy has to see, uh, I mean, you know, going to organizational sociology, legit legitimacy um, is increased when authority is perceived as legitimate. And so when both sides recognize each other's intellectual authority, I'm not talking about who can do what, but intellectual authority, um, I think that and that takes time. Mm -hmm. It takes time, it takes effort and thought. And, mm -hmm. and as you say, many meetings. Yeah. Many meetings. Yeah, one, I did have another paper which I could have easily given the talk on about leadership moves related to partnering. And I actually shared that concept with Sean Reardon one time because we had a co present on something. He, he was laughing because it's like, really? I make leadership moves? And I think sometimes professors do. But, the, you know, it's kind of, uh, uh, what am I doing? And that's, no, that's an administrator. But it really is the moves you make, like you said, that are either going to, um, you know, address the, the, the relationship. Um, and how do you know when and how to make those moves? That's a good question. Okay, Willie and then Claudia. Yeah, I just have a question. Um, do you think that the, the funders 
people, the organizations that fund these partnerships, they have uh, expectations about the, the kind, the, the ways in which those partnerships should, should, should uh, work? Yeah. Or have you ever seen a situation in which you have to, to act differently yeah. because of a new funder, mm -hmm. funders different set of expectations? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. So I'm going to answer your question in two ways. The first is I have seen funders kind of act like this gentleman was talking about the, the, the skill, having these skills to partner. I've seen them act as intermediaries or brokers. And I would agree with you that they do kind of expect a certain type of skill from the researcher or practitioner. And they're trying to facilitate the, that space for them to interact and help execute those skills, uh, the, you know, embody those skills and knowledge. Um, and so I would say that, I, I would say, you know, not all funders are paying attention to partnering. Um, I think there, there's, you know, you have the Spencer Foundation, the W.T. Grant Foundation. There are a few other ones popping up now, some more locally, like the partnership in Houston, at Houston and Rice University, the John Arnold Foundation gives a lot of money to. And um, they have doubled down on this concept. I think, a lot of it has to do with um, funders. Uh, I, I think funders that are funding this work usually fund a concept that's kind of half-baked, that has some progress that has been seen. At least that's what I've seen. Um, like, for example, I'll use the, the Rice University in Houston. Independent School District example, they had a professor there who actually has come and talk here, Ruth Lopez Turley, who really did some groundwork around partnering before she went to them and pitched the concept. Um, and so I think a lot of the funders that are involved that I see want to see evidence of it working. Um, do they want to see these skills? Some of them do that are in the weeds. Um, I know the WT Grant Foundation actually studies the use of research evidence, right? So they're really in the weeds, but they um, uh, they also are trying to field build as well, so they're a little different. Um, you know, I don't think funders are going to hold, these aren't going to be necessarily the outputs and outcomes that they say, hey, how are you doing on your partnering skills, right? Uh, let me see evidence, but I know like Ed Partners has some funding right now from the Gates Foundation. Um, and it's these, you know, learning hub networks. Um, they're really networked improvement movement communities. They're across the nation. There's 17 of them. 14 of the 17 say they're all doing improvement science, and yet most of the people that are come to the the meetings to discuss are like, deer in the headlights. What are we doing? You know, they're still learning the skills. And I think Gate, the Gates Foundation is trying to figure out how to hold them accountable to those skills so they've built this learning community. They're sometimes somewhat acting like this coach or intermediary to help build those skills. I, it's a really good question in terms of how they'll evaluate it and whether they will. Um, but I will I will research that question and get back to you. Thank you. Claude? First of all, thanks for your interesting comments and insights. Um, speaking of research um, and sort of looking ahead to um, I don't know if you call it an incipient research agenda, emerging research agenda. I'm wondering um, how important do you think it is to um, establish some criteria, criteria by which you would declare a partnership successful yeah. or unsuccessful? Yeah. And if we sat around for 30 seconds, we could each generate about a dozen different criteria. Mm -hmm. um, and then sort of take those as objectives and then sort of work backwards from that. You know, a very standard paradigm you're trying to understand a phenomenon, like reading comprehension. Right. You study right. good we'll comprehenders, bad comprehenders, mm -hmm. how are they different, right? Yeah. So provide some hypotheses. Mm -hmm. You could easily see that sort of paradigm in this research, mm -hmm. but you have to identify some criteria right. for what constitutes a successful versus not successful or middling successful mm -hmm. partnership. So my question is really how important do you think that is as a step. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, assuming you think it has some merit, what criteria would you begin to investigate Suggest. to distinguish successful from not so successful, successful. Yeah. 
So actually, one of the papers, which um, this paper with Heinrich, Heinrich Cobb, Penwell, and Clark, actually attempts to do this. So they've been funded by WT Grant to posit, uh, I don't know if it's the theory of action or the working criteria for successful partnerships. They, they based it off of a set of interviews across partnerships. Um, and they are now going to work on testing those criteria. And I've been involved in conversations about what it would look like to test them. Um, I have, in those conversations, said I think we're down a slippery slope right now. Are these criteria for holding these partnerships accountable? Or are they, are they for continuous improvement? And the researchers in the room say, well, can't they be for both? And then I say to the measurement people, well, wait a minute, you know, what is this tool being used for? And isn't it used for one person, purpose or another? So that's the question I would ask back to you. And it's kind of, you know, Taylor, you know, on the coattails of what Willie's saying is, um, is this for a funder to help coach and improve the partnering skills, that criteria? Or is it to study them? You know, what would be the purpose of those criteria? And uh, I do think it's worthy. Um, we have a set of criteria we use, right, within our incentive fund. Um, and I do think they are, uh, we're actually narrowing, we'll, you will hear later in the annual meeting, we're narrowing that criteria. Um, but uh, this concept. Or, excuse me, narrow the criteria to determine whether a partnership has been successful? Yes. Yes, and we use it as a criteria to guide people's development of RFPs or proposals to the incentive fund, which is a fund that the Graduate School of Education has to incentivize research professors um, to do research with San Francisco Unified in partnership. Um, and one of those criteria is this concept of ownership or district ownership, which is a lot to unpack. But I really think that is one of the key factors of success and it comes back to the question Michelle asked and the answer Norma gave is, and this idea of can you ask a researchable question, right? So um, do, does the, and to the joint work too, was the administrator involved in helping to come up with the research question and think about the idea? Were, are they willing to operational, help operationalize that project? And do they have an idea of how they'll use the findings? And that is a criteria. It really is a make or break in the proposals that we see. And it's very, it becomes quite clear either through a letter um, and, or through the way the proposal is written, whether it's there or not. The other criteria we have is around generalizability. And the reason why we have that is um, it's a kind of a back doorway, in my opinion, at getting at whether things, this project's mutually beneficial. Because ultimately, I do think researchers are interested in adding to the field. And we can't ignore that in, from our perspective. Um, so we do think the rigor and the validity of the research and, and whether or not it, it moves the theory um, is important, just as well as its usefulness. Can I push on this a bit? Yeah, go ahead. Other people have comments, I don't know. But I mean, it seems to me you're describing as I'm listening, you're describing more how you evaluate a proposal to engage yeah. in a partnership. Yeah. Right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about at the end of the partner, you know, uh, I'm, I see. We had a meeting Outcomes. a few weeks ago. Yeah. And you asked us to write a vision statement, right? At the end of this partnership, this is what yes. you'll see. Yes. Right? And yes. we had different things. How do I describe that? Yes. So what would be the criterion mm -hmm. for successful partnership because I'm, I'm asking the research context yes if you want to differentiate successful or unsuccessful which you yeah. cannot do at the proposal writing stage that's correct it's once it's done yes done is, how do we evaluate it then what criteria do you use and then working backwards from that what are the skills that were deployed what were the structures that were used right to help us understand what the whole logic partnership. Model there. Yes. I mean it's got to be sort of kind of retrospective yeah, so in this paper here, they have these five criteria, and the feedback they've gotten on this paper, they don't talk about how the criteria relate to each other. But to your point, some of the criteria are for the beginning stages, and some of the criteria are more for the inputs, and some of the criteria are more for the outputs or the outcomes. And to answer your questions, sorry, I didn't fully answer it. Uh, when people ask me, how do you judge success, 
Well, first I asked, why don't you go ask the people that were part of the project and ask the administrator, was this useful? And was it, and ask the uh, researcher, was this beneficial for you, right? Did you learn something? Did you produce something? The hard part is that incentive for them to be involved could be very different from researcher to researcher to administrator to administrator. Um, I think ultimately the thing they have in common though is learning. And I used to say, oh, you know, to a funder, I'd say, if you want to judge the impact of the partnership, you think about did it, you know, positively affect student achievement project by project, teacher practice, leadership practice, policy decisions, project by project, and judge them that way. But I actually don't think that's a very good way to judge them. I think the learning is probably better, but, it, but again, each one has its own context. Um, so I do think it would be tricky. And that's why I've kind of pushed back on these researchers out here who want to create criteria and judge these partnerships. I said, I think it'd be great for continuous improvement. I think having a protocol or a, a framework like that and a criteria would be helpful to help maybe at the beginning stages or at the end stages um, shape the, the partnership work. But I'm not sold on it when it comes to research, <coughs> even though I am half researcher too. Yes, well, I think we have time for one more, yeah. So um, in some of my experience with research practice partnerships, it seems like you know there's this shared high order goal that everyone wants to benefit the students. Mm -hmm. But often one of the biggest challenges is in the conflict of interest where researchers want to keep testing and doing randomized controlled trials, whereas <laughs> practitioners, you know, they definitely want to quickly roll it out to as many people as possible, especially after an intervention has been found successful. Um, can you offer some concrete advice or examples on how to navigate these kinds of situations? Yeah. Well, so I would ask you in that situation, first of all, how long have you been working together? Because if you've been only working together a short amount of time, I would, I, I, my advice to you would be that you need to have a few conversations to come to consensus about what you're going to do, right? And um, I tend to lean on, back to the criteria I was just saying, that if the administrator really isn't interested in it or isn't gonna potentially use what you're gonna, your next RCT is gonna be in some way, then you're gonna have a hard time working with them. They're just not gonna be as willing to operationalize it, they're not gonna be as interested in the findings, they're not as willing to experiment on their group, right? And so if you're on the early phases, you really need to come to that consensus around what is gonna be the joint work. Um, if, you're, if you've been working together for five years, you can kind of it's not necessarily a consensus decision. It could be a debate where one person could win. Like, hey, I've, I've been working with you a long time. You have more social capital with this person as a researcher, with the administrator. And so it could be something where you're, you're, you, you push each other a little bit more and you each do something that's a little more risky. But I do think you need to judge whether or not your kind of that interaction how you navigate that interaction by how long you've been working together. Norma, you want to add to yeah, that? Yeah, I do. I would say that there's a lot of middle ground between that dichotomy, that we don't really need that the methodology of controlled RCTs, and we don't really need the approach of, now it worked once, let's scale it up all the way. There's a huge middle ground where we have to look at the details of the implementation and the adaptation. There's a lot of research methodology that could go on there that would be productive research and would also result in effective practice. And I think that's the space that we ought to be encouraging a lot more research in. Is that helpful? Yeah, it's not, it, it's hard because this is back to the kind of soft skills and you have to judge the situation, um, situation by situation. So there could be a time and part of it is knowing who is the administrator you're talking to. You know, maybe as a researcher in that situation, you might go talk to other researchers that have also worked with that administrator to try to understand how they might be thinking, right? Um, whereas if you knew that administrator really well, you could probe their thinking, right? So there's some, there's some concrete moves you can make. But it really is judging the situation. And so I'd say consensus in the beginning is really important. It's really got to be mutually beneficial. Thank you. This is fascinating 
in terms of communication between cultures. I'm curious um, to what degree uh, in your remarkable, interesting focus on the San Francisco Unified School District, um, analytically in the sort of one half of the partnership, that um, the, those folks who are the researchers and administrators at the San Francisco Unified School District could begin to look at Stanford and pondering excellence here, which is far-reaching in my experience, by perhaps either talking with uh, deans who um, develop uh, research and skill-based approaches here, or administrators um, who might be different from those deans, such that the learning uh, in partnership is initiated from the San Francisco, San Francisco Unified School District um, with a lens on Stanford that then could be um, further developed skill-wise um, by those who uh, are developing the partnership at, uh, on the FS, SF uh, USD Just side, Norma, perhaps. Um, so, Co, I want to feedback your question, so just to see if I understand. So, you're asking if what we learn from San Francisco Unified mm -hmm. could be shared back to the school just to Stanford, right? And then uh, so that Stanford could help, we could it could improve an understanding of how Stanford could better work with San Francisco. Did I, uh, uh, I think. Um, it, it might be perhaps slightly different, such that uh, using Norma as an example, um, she might come into Stanford, um, look at uh, what practices, skills um, are here out of the conversation that's already emerged thus far between this, in this partnership, mm -hmm. and then um, further focus those skills mm -hmm. um, at the San Francisco Unified School District level vis-a-vis uh, -vis her and yeah. other uh, We were just talking about this at the car ride, if I'm understanding you correctly. So explicitly around like the research skills, um, we were talking about who we could, at the graduate school of education, could tap to teach interviewing to a set of administrators. Um, are you talking about those type of hard skills? Um, yeah, and I'd also flip your question too because I thought what you were asking is like, what expertise do the administrators bring that they could also teach to the, pro to the academics and the professors? Because I think it does go both ways, and this is, I think, again, I thank Michelle Renninger for kind of saying, don't forget, it's that two-way street. Um, because I do think sometimes there's this practical knowledge that, uh, not sometimes, all the time, there's practical knowledge from the field that really can enhance the research questions that administrate uh, that researchers are asking. That uh, without it, 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 it uh, leaves us in our ivory tower or our bubble. Um, so I think that skill building kind of go, goes both ways um, in terms of learning. But we do draw. We actually have brought in researchers to teach quasi. How, how do you organize to the research department? How do you organize a quasi experimental analysis or um, things to that extent? So yeah, we have done that learning both ways. We do have an annual meeting every year uh, where we share uh, out in kind of a conference style findings, but it's um, in, in their joint presentation, so the researcher and practitioner are presenting, and it, um, it's somewhat organized like a wedding in that it's intentionally people are seated next to people that they don't know so that you get to know each other, and then they can start to understand what is the expertise in the room, and what can I learn from this administrator or this researcher? We have about five more minutes, right? We go to 5.30, I can't remember. Okay, 5.30, yeah. yeah. Anyone have any final questions? Yeah. I'm wondering a little bit, you've talked a lot about the partnership between university researchers and administrators in school districts, but one of the things that I've seen in partner research practitioner partnerships is yeah. that buy-in from the people who are actually making the intervention happen yep. is really important. And I'm wondering yep. if you could speak to the voice of teachers or other folks mm -hmm. in the school system mm -hmm. in designing the research questions and being a part of the, that process. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, our The theory of action that I work on in research practice partnerships really relies on the central office to be that intermediary. And that's not always a good thing. <laughs> Um, and oft sometimes researchers get, uh, many times researchers get involved with the teachers at the school site and they're like, oh, did you know this or that is going on? Um, 
but I um, and I there's a lot of actual literature on research done in partnership with teachers, right? But that's why I said this literature. I, I try to constrain this literature review to partnerships that um, had a certain certain characteristics. Uh, but um, I'd say the challenges in a large urban school district is a large urban school district is trying to build coherence. They have to hold a standard across all their classrooms. And so if you have a set of teachers uh, tinkering over here doing this or that, um, from the central office point of view, if the central office doesn't know that, and then something happens that's not that great for students, then it's challenging. At the same time, I was just at a school board meeting with Woodside, at Woodside uh, School District, and I was with Dean Schwartz, and we were presenting on, hey, you want to do this partnership? And this, uh, the kicker was one of their teacher leads stands up, and he goes, oh, I, I used to work at San Francisco Unified. And some of the best work I've done as a teacher was when I was working with that Stanford researcher in my classroom. So I think it, it uh, I think it's challenging. I think the best thing to do is if you are if you are doing that, to really probe the teacher around. Hey, do we have permission from the district to be here? Does your principal know about this? I mean, the challenge is if you're doing something in one classroom. Um, how can you think of implement think about implementing what you're doing in that one classroom at scale? I'm actually not talking about working with one teacher. I'm talking about district-wide implementation, uh -huh. but including teacher voice in the process. Great. Because often the voice is from the administrator yes. who may or may not have a good sense of what's going on in the classroom. Yeah, so great question. Um, most of our projects that have um, an element of working with teachers um, involve them at some t stage of the design process, I would agree with you, it, it probably should happen more up front. Um, we do rely on the administrators, just from my experience, for that teacher voice. Uh, and I think it's a great question. I mean, there's a lot of uh, work, I'd say, like the design-based implementation research or even the learning sciences probably does the best job of building diverse teams um, that are designing interventions. Uh, from what I've seen, and getting that diversity of perspective. I mean, there's a lot from the design world that suggests they should always be involved, and your end user um, should be involved. So, Can you just add a couple of things. Sure. I think that's an extremely important question because we need to rely on the administrators to nurture those relationships, and we would not encourage the researchers to reach out to the teachers directly because we need to shield them from lots of requests. And as Laura pointed out, some administrators are more in touch with what their teachers want than others. So I would encourage you as a researcher who's considering that to really ask the probing questions of the administrators to get the sense of the alignment. Because we have certainly seen studies where the teachers are expected to do something and they're incentivized in a certain way that isn't really in line with it. And so then you don't get the good participation rates that you might desire. And then it's not a good use of anybody's time. So I would encourage everyone to be very attentive to that because we can't really have you ask that question of the teachers, but ask it of the administrators to find out, is this really in line with what they want? And find out what kind of evidence they can provide you for that. Because sometimes you have one client and it is so powerful, and other times they're not gonna provide the data that you're looking for. And if you ask, if you're working with an administrator and you ask, hey, how can we get teacher voice in this? And they're like, oh, we don't need that maybe that's an indicator to you that maybe it's not the right match for you, right? Um, so that's something you can suss out earlier, early as a researcher. Okay, I think we're at time. I'm happy to stay and answer any questions, but thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.